Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem shortest bridge. We're given an n by n matrix, so that's a square matrix. And one is going to represent land and zero is going to represent water. An island in this case is a four directionally connected group of ones. That's kind of usually what they say four directionally. So if we had a grid like this, a two by two grid, you can see that these two ones are not connected because they're connected diagonally. But if we replace that with a one here, now all three of these are connected. They can only be connected up, down, left, right. And they tell us conveniently that there's exactly two islands in the grid. We're allowed to change zeros into ones to connect the two islands to form a single island. The question is though, what's the minimum number of zeros that we would have to flip to connect the two islands? So they kind of gave us a story, but that's not so important. Let's actually try to draw out what they're asking from us to make it really simple what we need to solve. So let's take a look at this example. Now they said that we want to flip the minimum number of zeros to connect you know, these two islands over here. But what that really just means is what's the shortest path from one island to another. Now, in this case, we can literally start at either island, right? The shortest path from here to here is gonna be the same going the other way anyway. But before you get too fancy thinking about shortest path and you think maybe Dijkstra's algorithm is what we need to do, don't get uh, too crazy because in this case, we don't need Dijkstra's because the, there's no weight on the edges, and that's what Dijkstra's is for. So we can use a more simple algorithm to find the shortest path. But another kind of problem almost is that usually with shortest path, we start at one position and then go to another. Now, in this case, it's not really like that. We're actually starting from, you know, an entire group of cells that are at least they're connected, they're contiguous, but it's a group of them. And we're not looking for a destination. We're looking for multiple destinations. But that's okay because the standard algorithm usually defines shortest paths with unweighted edges is BFS. And BFS can be applied to multiple sources and multiple destinations. All we really have to do is run BFS starting at one of the islands. It could be either island. Let's say we start at this one. We initially add these four values to the queue, and then we go layer by layer. So in reality, this is our starting point, and it took us zero uh, flips to get to each of these. Now, to get to all of the neighbors, it's gonna take one flip uh, to get to each of them, right? We have to flip a single zero. So it's getting pretty messy here. Doing a BFS, right? We, we start from here and we go to all the neighbors, right? We obviously, we don't want duplicates. We're not gonna visit the same position multiple times, but looking at all the neighbors without going out of bounds, of course, you can see that we can reach these and these in one uh, move, right? One flip. Now, if we take these cells that I've circled, I changed the color, but now if you take a look at these cells that I circled, these and these, these are the cells we can reach in one move. So now these are going to be added to our queue. Now let's find all the cells we can reach in two moves. It's basically going to be the neighbors over here because these don't really have any valid neighbors. We don't want to revisit these ones multiple times. So, okay, so I know it's kind of messy, but so these ones highlighted in green are the ones we can reach in two moves. Now we're going to run BFS again from these. And what we're going to find is, you know, running BFS from this one, we look in all four directions. Uh, we see the only unvisited one is this. And we say it takes three moves to get there. We're going to say the same for this. It takes three moves to get here. And of course, we're going to actually reach the other island and we're going to find it took three moves to reach the other island. Now they actually asked for the number of zeros we have to flip. Technically, we only had to flip two zeros to get here, right? We don't really count the island itself. So it took two moves for us to get here, right? So we created a bridge. In this case, you know, this could be one of the bridges, right? That connected this island with this one. And funny enough, I think I might have made a mistake. Actually, this one should not be one. And I don't think this one should be two either. But uh, I, don't, I don't think that really changes the problem too much. I hope you at least get the idea. I think it should have looked a little bit more like this. Sorry about that. But th that's generally the idea, though. All we're doing is a BFS from one of the islands to the other island. Now, how we're actually going to implement this 
we're actually also going to need a DFS because we have to find one of the islands. We know there's two islands, exactly two islands, but we have to find at least one of them. So what we're going to do is just kind of a brute force search over the entire grid until we find a single one. And then on that one, we're going to run a DFS to get the entire island. Like this orange one over here, we want to get the entire island, add it to a visit a hash set. And then from that visit hash set, we're going to use that as our queue. We're going to convert it to a queue and then basically do a BFS until we reach the other island and then return whatever, you know, the number of zeros we had to flip to get there. So even though we're doing a DFS and a BFS, the time complexity of both of those algorithms is roughly the same on an n by n grid. So the time complexity is going to be n squared. The memory complexity is also going to be n squared because of the visit hash set as well as the queue that we're going to need for BFS. Technically, we actually don't need a visit hash set because we could overwrite the input grid if we really wanted to, but I try to avoid that when it's possible. It usually takes a couple extra lines of code to use a visit hash set, but I think it's fine because sometimes your interviewer doesn't want you to overwrite the memory. Maybe you can just ask them and if they're fine with it, uh, you know, you can do that because it saves you a couple lines of code. But now let's jump into the coding solution. Okay, so now let's code it up and it's gonna be pretty long, I'm not gonna lie, because we're gonna have to do DFS and BFS. Uh, first thing I usually like to do though with a uh, grid problems is just get the dimensions of the board. In this case, both uh, the number of rows and the number of columns is the exact same. Uh, it's gonna be N. And one other like helper variable I'm gonna declare right now, uh, which we're gonna use later, is just f the four directions, zero, one, zero, negative one, these are basically going to come in handy for our uh, graph algorithms when we want to like go in those four uh, vertical horizontal directions. Okay, next I'm also going to declare a little helper variable just to check if a coordinate is out of bounds. Usually I don't need a helper variable for this, but since we're doing DFS and BFS, it might be kind of helpful given a row and column. How do we know if it's out of bounds? Well, if row is less than zero or column is less than zero or row is equal, to the number of rows or column is equal to the number of columns. That means it's out of bounds. So we can just literally return this. This is gonna return a Boolean. It'll tell us if the position is out of bounds. Next, let's do the DFS. So given a row and column, we want to run DFS on it. So the first thing we wanna know though is, is it out of bounds? Uh, if this row column is out of bounds, then we want to uh, return immediately. We don't want to continue doing DFS on it. The other thing is if it is water. So basically if not grid at this position, it has to be a one. It has to be land for us to be able to DFS on it. If it's water, we don't do anything. And the last or is if this row column is already in our visit hash set, which I'm going to declare, I guess right here, we could actually declare it down below. Uh, it doesn't really matter because or when you have nested functions like this, they have access to the variables that are defined outside of them or functions that are you know declared over here, just like we're using this here. Okay, but if it's not out of bounds, it's not water and it hasn't been visited already, then we can go ahead and add it to the visit set. That means it's part of the first island that we're visiting. And then this is the part where our directions are gonna come in. We'll call it DRDC. We're gonna iterate through this array of pairs that we declared all the way up above, direct. We're just gonna call DFS on R plus DR, C plus DC. So literally just calling DFS on the four adjacent directions. Okay, so that was not too difficult if you're familiar with DFS. Uh, next, let's do BFS. I hope you're familiar with that as well. Uh, because this is definitely a lot of code to write out if you're not familiar with DFS and BFS. So the way I'm going to implement BFS, we actually don't need any uh, input parameters. Uh, we are going to have a result though, because what this BFS wants to do uh, actually, before I even write this out, let me show you how we're actually going to be using this DFS and BFS uh, before we write it out, just to give you a bit more context. What we're going to do is literally just iterate over the entire uh, input array, input grid, actually. And if we get to a position that's not water, uh, so like we get to uh, an island, the first time we reach any piece of land, what we're going to do 
is run DFS on it. Now, what this DFS is really important for, it's not really returning anything. What it's gonna do though, is it's gonna fill up the visit hash set with one of the islands, only one of the islands though, because after we execute the DFS for the first time, immediately after that, we're gonna call BFS, which should, uh, the reason we're not passing any parameters though, is inside the BFS, it's internally going to use this visit hash set as the queue and then uh, do BFS starting from there. And what this should return is the is basically the minimum length, whatever the shortest bridge is. And we're gonna go ahead and just return that. That's all we need to do. We don't even need to visit a second piece of land. As soon as we visit the first one, we're gonna go ahead and return. Okay, I hope that gives you an idea of what we're trying to do. So in BFS, we're gonna have a result that's gonna be whatever the length of the bridge is. And second uh, parameter or variable we're gonna have is a deck or a queue, a double-ended queue, which we're gonna initialize with the visit hash set value. So that's what our queue is initially gonna be. So now at this point, all we really have to do is just implement a standard BFS uh, algorithm, which if you've done many times, this should be easy. If you haven't though, of course, this is gonna be pretty challenging. So we're gonna continue while our queue is non-empty. And now we're going to kind of go through the first layer because we wanna count how many layers we have gone through because that is really what we're gonna return, the length, right? So every layer counts as one increment to this result. So to do that is we're just gonna create a variable i, which we're not really gonna use, but for in range, whatever the length of the queue currently happens to be. So imagine if the queue looked something like this, one, two, three, we're going to uh, iterate through it. And as we iterate through it, we might be adding, we're basically gonna be popping values, right? We're gonna pop the one, we're gonna pop the two, et cetera, et cetera. But as we do that, we're also gonna be adding values as well. So let's say we add a four, we add a five, uh, and then we finish this iteration of the loop because we did the first three elements, we did the first layer, and then we're gonna go through the second layer. And as we go through a layer, we're gonna increment our result. The way this works, uh, it's not gonna keep calling length on the queue as we add elements to it. This is pretty much a snapshot. This is the same as if we were doing something like this, length of queue, and then take that variable and then iterate through that. I think, you know, for some reason, this is more clear for people. I think people kind of get confused with what's going on when we write it the other way, like this. They think like this is going to continuously be updated as the queue is updated, but that's not the case. This is a snapshot. Okay, though, uh, as we iterate through the queue, we want to pop values. So we're going to pop a row and column. So queue.pop left and uh, we're gonna do a BFS, so we're gonna look at the four adjacent directions. So again, we're gonna use our direct array directions. I uh, declared up above, DRDC in that uh, array of pairs. So I'm gonna actually create uh, variables for this, so current R, which is for current row, current C for current column, and that's gonna be R plus DR and C plus DC, because we're actually gonna be needing these variables a few times. So first thing to check is if we're out of bounds, so we're gonna be needing our helper function again, passing in current uh, row, current column. If we're out of bounds, or if the uh, current row column pair has already been visited before, if that's the case, then we're going to continue to the next iteration of the loop because this cell has already been visited or it's out of bounds, so we can go ahead and skip it. Uh, but if we now reached a cell that hasn't been visited and the cell is a one, that must mean we reached the other island. So in that case, we can actually just go ahead and return our result, uh, which is gonna be the length, the length of the zeros we had to visit to get there. But if it's not the result, then uh, we can go ahead and add it to our queue uh, because it's water, uh, we can also add it to visit so that we don't end up visiting it multiple times. And that's pretty much it. We know eventually we're gonna reach a second island, so we know for sure this return is going to execute at some point. Uh, but until it does, uh, every for loop means we just went through a layer. So as we go through layers, we're gonna increment our result by one because we just went through a layer of water, and that's what we're trying to count. Uh, how many water positions we had to do to get to the second island. Okay, that is the entire code. It's so big that it doesn't fit on the screen. Had to zoom out a bit, but here's the entire code. Let's run it to make sure that it works. Okay, I was dumb and I forgot a colon over here. So, 
Okay, I was dumb again. I tried to add a list to a hash set. This needs to be a pair or a tuple so you can hash it. Okay, with my dumb bugs out of the way, you can see that yes, the, generally the code does work and it's pretty efficient. So I really hope that this was helpful. If it was, please like and subscribe. It really supports the channel a lot. Consider checking out my Patreon where you can further support the channel and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon. Thanks for watching.